Amen. And what a mighty name it is, hey? Who is happy to be at church this yes, morning? come on. There is warmth so and there good. is love in this house and thank you for being part of it. Hey, there's there's something really special that's happening this week. Yeah. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Ooh. Spring is coming. Yes. So I want How you to turn good. to your neighbour and say something that you are grateful for about spring. Oh, that's a good one. Yes. Ooh. Blossoms. I love blossoms. Yes, I'm ready for the warm weather. And the warm weather. Yes, for sure. visitor in this church, we want to say a very, very warm welcome. Yes. Hello. My name is Belinda and this is Anna. Hello. So glad you're here. Yes. It's now, true. we've got some announcements. Of course. We have this morning my hunk adorable husband, Josh O'Callaghan, bringing oh. the last message of our uh Keys of Life. Yes. Keys of Life series. Very exciting. It's been a really good series, hasn't it? I've loved it. You've been enjoying it? Yeah. Yeah, so good. And next week, it is Father's Day, and I believe Pastor Mark is bringing the word he in is. our new series called Light and Love. And it's also, we come early at 9.30, I believe, for breakfast for Father's Day, bacon and eggs. It's going to be That's awesome. That's right. As well as there's going to be a bit of a car show. So if you have a really cool car, bring it. And show it off to everyone. It's yes. Be good. And then we are going from Ferraris to Safaris. Yes. Because then the following week is Sunday Fun Day. Sunday isn't Friday, it? Yeah. Sunday Fun Day. There's going to so, be a petting zoo, I believe. Oh my goodness. I love. Wow. I love Africa. Yeah. I love. I love it's animals, of course. I've still got a bit what? of puppy food on me. We've oh. just introduced our seven golden retrievers to puppy food, so it is chaos. Beautiful chaos in yes. our house. But yeah. From safaris, yes. from Ferraris to safaris it's true. to then we have also Liberté. Liberté. Today. Today. And every week. What is for Liberté Bell? Please it's, let me um, know. <laughs> spring rolls. And oh. um oh, noodles. 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 And love drumsticks because ice cream is the bomb. I agree. As well. Yes. Well, can you share on our offering? I would Anna? love to. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I would love to. Why not? Well, well, how are we going? Just good. Awesome. Now, I just wanted to ask you guys a question. I feel like during the week I was thinking like, what should I share on my offering? And I was like, oh, I feel like everything's been said. Like, surely, like, is there something else? And I thought. What better to do to actually go back to the basics and go to the core of why we give? And I feel like we can be asked, like, why do we give? And be like, oh, you know, to give it back to God, which is 100% true. We do do it to give back to God. But I feel like sometimes we can get in the habit of just saying that, yeah, you know, to give it back to God, I just, like, give my money. But it's actually important that we actually, in our hearts, we're asking ourselves week after week, like, why are we doing this? And, like, where is our money actually going? Because... When we see these small moments, like someone might be raising their hand, like that encounter with God, that is because we are actually giving. Like we need to ask ourselves, like, am I doing this just out of habit or am I doing this because of like, we just want to glorify God in everything we do. So I have a verse, let me just get it up. And that is, it's, you might have heard it before, but it's from Colossians 3 verse 17. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. It's just something I believe, we hear it all the time, but it's something we really need to remind ourselves that we actually do things to represent God. He has given us this full life of all these great things. And like, why wouldn't we just want to give a small part of that back? And we don't want to be grow to doing out of habit and doing it just because like it's just what we do on a Sunday. We want to actually do it like for those moments, for those encounters, for the things that are happening in the kitchen, the things that are happening online. We want to actually glorify God and those small encounters that we see with people having, that is because of our generosity in us giving. So I just want to ask you this morning, when you're giving, what is your motivation behind that? So the details on the screen and the usher is going to come around and I'm just going to pray. And as I pray, I just want to invite you to actually pray in your heart as well. Like, God, 
like, can you just speak to me? Like, why am I giving this money? And actually let him challenge you on this. Let it not be out of habit, but out of conviction. So yeah. God, I just pray for every single person. I just thank you that you are so present in our lives, God, and that you have given us this wonderful life. I just pray that as we are giving, God, that we are giving it out of conviction, God, that we actually want to see those moments happen. It's not just about the physical things that money can buy, but it's actually about the words that you speak to people. It's actually about how you're moving in people's lives, God, and we actually want to step forward in faith and help with that, whether that's with our time or with our money, God. So I just thank you, Lord, for what you have already done, and I thank you for what you're going to do in your name amen amen awesome Fantastic. we're going to head back hey, into church some worship we're stand and sing one more time just while the offerings collected and for those who are joining us online this morning i want to encourage you the atmosphere in this room is amazing this morning the congregation is singing so beautifully so my prayer is if you're watching online at home that you'd be standing in your living room standing in your lounge room you would join with us you would sing with us this morning Sing praise. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. Of kings. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. One more time. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. God of glory, majesty. Praise forever to the King of kings. Yes, Father, we want to praise you. We want to lift your name up that as we're concluding this series on the Psalms, songs in the key of life, we can think what importance does a song have? But it's not just about a song. Lord, it's about you. It's about giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, the worship that you truly deserve Lord you and you alone deserve all the praise all the glory and all the honor that we have to give this morning so Lord as we gather around your word Lord we just pray that you would speak to us Lord we know that your presence is here in this room and we know that you desire to be with us and to speak to us this morning in Jesus name Amen Amen. You may be seated. Well, a few weeks ago, it was uh, little uh, Xavier uh, Eckerman's third birthday. It's a very exciting day for three-year-olds, and uh, uh, he loves animals. He can name just about any animal that you can speak of, and so uh, Nicole and Ian decided that they would uh, take him to uh, Monado Safari Park uh, just down the road here and uh, Belinda and I are members and so we thought we'll come along and, and join in the fun and uh, we go there quite a lot seeing that we are members we have the opportunity to go there and it's a great place to go there's always something new to, to see new animals being born all the time uh, but it was a whole new experience seeing it through the eyes of a three-year-old Everything was wow. Every single... And it kind of reminded me of sort of the, the first time that I had gone there. It was way back in the 80s. 
Back before it was even open to the public, I got to go there and uh, feed bison off the back of a ute. And so that was kind of a really wow experience for me. And then even a few months ago uh, for Belinda's birthday, we had the opportunity to sort of go behind the scenes and um, help get the lions actually into their night enclosure. Like at the end of the day, once uh, everyone's gone home, uh, they need to get the lions into their, into their den at night time. And uh, so what they do is they give you this big chunk of meat, like, you know, five or six kilos of meat, and you kind of stand there at the end of this runway... And this 220 kilo lion who's hungry comes running at you with hunger in his eyes. And that was kind of, that was wow. (laughs) But seeing Xavier just uh, wowing at at everything, I realized that I've kind of lost my wow in the everyday things. That we kind of, as we get older, we've reserved our wow for the the big things, the huge things. And so really, I have kind of one point, one message today. And that is for you to get your wow back. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, where's your wow? And maybe turn to the person on the other side, your, your second favourite person, and just say in your loudest voice, wow, but, but say wow backwards. <laughs> Took everyone just a half a second to get that one. All right, so our aim today is to get our wow back. That's what we're going to do. And uh, so are you ready to get your wow back? Yeah. All right, here we go. This is my best... Uh, my best effort to get, give you wow back. Let's let's roll the video. Shoots here. We'll go for this one. All right. Did that make you go wow? Yeah. Fantastic. All right. I just need to take this off and out. All right. Well, if you all said wow, we can go home, can't we? But of course, the point is not for you to actually go wow at me. The point is for you to wow at God, at who he is and what he does. You see, we can all actually go wow over those mountaintop experiences. But we need to wow in the everyday or even better, our aim is to actually wow in the desert moments. To wow in the times when there's a dryness, there's a, there's a barrenness, there's not everything's going right. That there's still this opportunity to actually say, wow. And this is songs in the key of life. And I don't know if you know, but certain keys are happy keys and certain keys are sad or depressing keys. And I don't just mean that, you know, these individual keys on the keyboard, you know, this one's happy and this one's sad, but like the key that things are written in actually 
changes the mood, changes the sound of a song. Things in a, a minor key are often more depressive. And so if we had to write a, a song, a, a soundtrack for your life, how would it sound? What would the key be? Some songs, particularly classical songs, they can last for 15 to 20 minutes or, or more and they build to a crescendo. So the whole thing is building towards this part and the crescendo can be just one note. And so everything beforehand and everything after was all building towards that one point, that one note. But we don't want our lives to be like that, where we're just working for the weekend or slaving, waiting for holidays or building our career, waiting for retirement, just waiting for that one moment in our life where we can say, wow. We need to come to the place where we can actually say, wow, in the desert. And I think that that's what Psalm 95 is actually encouraging us to do. Because our wow is our worship. When we say wow at something, we stop what we're doing our gaze our attention is fixed on something that we just think is amazing and it can be footy or cars or achievements or different things but it should be God that should have our attention our wow above all else so with that in mind we're going to read Psalm 95 one more time now that we're looking for this idea of how together we can wow in those desert times. So it says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us give a shout to the rock who saves us. Let us come to him and give him thanks. Let us praise him with music and song. The Lord is the great God. He is the greatest king. He rules over all gods. He owns the deepest parts of the earth. The mountain peaks belong to him. The ocean is his because he made it. He formed the dry land with his hands. Come, let us bow down and worship him. Let us fall on our knees in front of the Lord, our maker. He is our God. We are the sheep belonging to his flock. We are the people he takes care of. If you would only listen to his voice today, he says, don't be stubborn as you were at Meribah. Don't be stubborn as you were that day in Massa in the desert. There, your people long ago really tested me. They did it even though they had seen what I had done for them. For 40 years, I was angry with them. I said, their hearts are always going astray. They don't know how I want them to live. So I was angry and I made this promise. I said they will never enjoy the rest that I planned for them. First half is really nice, isn't it? It's kind of the thing that you would see on a poster or maybe Amy might be able to sew it into a pillow or something amazing. You know, it says like, you know, sing for joy and there's so much beautiful things. Come, let us bow down and and worship. But the second half kind of not so much. I mean, I can't imagine a poster or a pillow saying, I was angry with them. Or don't be stubborn or they will never enter my rest. Never enter my rest. That's not what you want on a pillow. That's the whole point of a pillow is for rest but understanding this is vital if we are going to understand how to wow in the desert see I often think that we think that corporate or group worship is for the highs of life and private prayers are for the lows we bring our lists we bring our petitions to God 
But what if the opposite is true? This psalm is the crescendo note on how to worship, how to wow in the desert. It is very descriptive. It tells us exactly what to do. It says, sing, make a loud shout, a a joyful noise. It tells us to fall to our knees, to, to bow down in humility when we come to worship. It reminds us that in our worship, that He is King, that He is Lord, that He is Creator, that He is powerful. All of these things are depicted in there that that should be the object of our worship, that as we come, this is how we should worship. But we also need to understand, as it said in that psalm, that He is our Shepherd. We need to worship Him as All of those, and somehow all of those things should be reflected in our lives, songs in the key of life. One of the things that you may have missed in the description that it gives us, that Psalm 95 gives us in how to worship, is that it's always done as a group. It says time and time again, let us, let us, let us come and worship Him. Now, of course, we could and should worship as individuals, but our individual worship is actually preparation for this crescendo note, this time where we do all gather together in worship that this time on a Sunday morning should be the highlight, the, the pinnacle of our week. And if we miss that, we miss the wow. We miss this time together. And we might think, but why? I mean, can't you be a Christian and not come to church? I mean, can't I just stay at home and watch Stephen Furtick and wasn't, isn't he going to bring a much better message than Pastor Josh on a Sunday? Can't I just put, like, you know, at home, we can, you know, we've got smart TVs and different things. Now we can select the exact, so our favorite song of worship that's been digitally remastered. Every note is perfect. And we can just worship to the songs that we like, that that you know, at the exact volume that that we want it at. I mean, Jacob's good, but he can never measure up to that. So aren't I getting a better experience being at home, watching online, doing those things? Yeah, that's possible. But again, we've missed the point we've missed what psalm 95 is saying we've missed that pinnacle the high note of our worship my phone is an amazing thing the moment that i select to listen to one song on spotify or play one video on youtube or Look at one reel on Instagram. It starts to create a a profile of exactly what I like. It starts to suggest other things, songs that I may not have heard before that uh, it says, you know, you would like, if you like that, then you will like this song, that you will like this video, that, you know, I can only see news feed that is directly in line with what I already think and and feel. And it makes life so much easier. And if I can only program my wife with the same algorithm, (laughs) my life would be so much... Any men in the house agree with me? Oh, a few brave men willing to put their hands. Everyone's like. (laughs) 
exactly right. I mean, it kind of, it would be easier, wouldn't it? But it would also be devoid of love. Because she's not a robot. And so God doesn't want that for our marriages. He doesn't want that for our lives. And he doesn't want that for our worship. So Church Online is a great tool. We actually, right now or through the week as people catch up, we will have more people watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify and downloading podcasts. We'll have more people watching online than is in the room right now. And for those of you that are watching that are currently serving and life kids, that's great. Or if you're you're sick and you can't get here, it's an amazing tool. Maybe there's a point that you miss, you want to go back and re-watch it. Maybe you have a, a friend who's interested in church but is just unsure about coming to church. You know, maybe they've heard from someone that we're a weird cult or do crazy things like watch crazy videos of the pastor's face on other things. And so it can be a, a great tool to just give people a, an inside look at to what church is like. It's a great tool that we need to use, but it should never replace the gathering together of us in the room, shoulder to shoulder, doing life together. It's easier, yes. But is it true worship? Psalm 95 would say no. It's actually the difficulties, the difficult people, the parts that you don't like, the parts that you can't fast forward through that actually make us stronger and better, that make our act of worship about love and not about ourselves and what we like and don't like. Proverbs 27:17 says as iron sharpens iron so one person sharpens another. And here if we have Two things. Now, if we kind of do church online and we put one thing over here and we have another over here, they're kind of not going to grade each other. They're not going to grind each other, but they're not going to change. They're going to stay exactly the same way. It's only as we bring these things together I'm going to do this with the mic. Tamsin, can you hold the mic? So, iron sharpens iron. There's things, there's, there's a friction that actually needs to take place. That actually the two parts make each other sharp. So, if there's dullness, it's made sharp. If there's roughness, it's made smooth if there's rust and different things it's it comes off but it only comes off through contact through friction through people that are different to us and coming into contact with those things thank you so as iron sharpens iron so one person sharpens another so are we a perfect church no do we have some people here that are going to say some things that are going to offend you? Probably. Is our music too loud? Yes. Is our music too quiet? Yes. Are the sermons too long and boring? Yes. 
Are the sermons not long enough? Yes. Do we need to value young people? Yes. Do we need to value older people? Yes. Loving, true worship. Our wow in the desert is when we all, young and old, black and white, rich and poor, addicted and free, anxious and extrovert, all come together, all with our different likes and dislikes, and we lay them down to simply worship Him. So the question is, is He above your preferences? Is He above your comfort and what you want? Seeing this unity, knowing that there is something above comfort, above happiness, above what we want will actually make our community go wow because that's all they've been told that they've been told that's the highest thing your happiness is the highest thing your preferences your likes are the highest thing that there is and so you need to do whatever you can to make sure that you are happy to make sure that you are getting those likes met and fed but we get to show them that there's something more, something higher by the way that we worship. So the first half of this psalm tells us how to worship. That we need to wow not just at what he does, but who he is. That we need to worship together, all together. That we need to worship God as creator, as king and as shepherd. That we need to worship in humility, that we come and we bow down. But the second half tells us how not to worship. It says, get this right and there is a peace, there is a rest, there is an eternity that is waiting for you. But it brings a, a warning, get this wrong, and you will never enter that rest. So songs in the key of life is this idea that there is when there is a note that is misplayed, when there is a note that wasn't part of the original tune that was set down by the author who, who wrote it, it should be obvious to us. So God is saying, I want you to know what that note is. Because a note played out of out of tune causes disease and unrest to your ears but a life lived out of tune brings unrest to your soul so there's a key change in this song as it transitions from this idea of love and adoration painting the picture of what to do to now changing to what not to do. And the line at which this key change happens, the line of this transition is found in verse 7, and it says, listen to God's voice today. And you know how with certain songs that come on the radio or maybe that you hear, it kind of, certain songs that are really important to you, songs that have been key in your life, that just hearing it, hearing one line from that song, it can kind of take you back to that memory, can take you back to that place. Maybe the first time you ever heard that song or a really important time in your life when that song came on. And this is what David is doing as he speaks this line. He's trying to get us to remember when was the first time when humanity didn't listen 
to God's voice. And what was the outcome of that? When was the first time that we didn't listen to God's voice? When Adam and Eve ate of that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the f- and what was their first response when that happened? When they heard the voice of God, when they heard God coming in the cool of the day after they had sinned, what was their response to hearing God? They hid. They were in guilt and shame. They wanted to draw back and cover themselves with fig leaves. It was basically the opposite of what worship should be. It paints us a picture of what not to do. Because what was God's first command to them? Before the Ten Commandments, before even the fall had happened, God gave humanity a commandment. I wonder if we remember today what that is. And some of us in this room might think the first command that God gave was in Genesis 2:17, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not eat of that fruit. And if we think that, and many of us probably do, we've sort of missed what he actually said before that because in Genesis 2 verse 16, it said, you may surely. And again, we're looking at this question, listen to God's voice today, but when you hear his voice, when you think about what he's going to say to you, do you think that he's going to say, thou shalt not first? Because that's going to affect the way that you approach him in worship. If you're just expecting him to bring correction, if the first thing that echoes in your ear is the thou shalt not, rather than the you may surely's, We've missed the point. But even before that, there was a commandment that was given back in Genesis 1. It said this, Be fruitful and multiply. Have dominion over. And in verse 29, Behold. What does behold mean? Wow. 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 Wow at the things of God. That was our first command. This was the first time that humanity had heard the voice of God. It wasn't with the thou shalt nots. It was fruit. It was blessing. It was come and wow. It was always what we were meant to do. So when you hear his voice, when you come in worship, are you coming reserved, fearful, not actually wanting to hear from God, not actually wanting to hear his voice? Or are you coming expectant to be a conqueror, to have dominion over? Are you expecting to receive of his fruitfulness, the command to behold, to to wow who he is. Then the song goes on to talk about some boring place names that obviously was supposed to mean something to some boring people long ago, but kind of doesn't really have any relevance to us today, does it? That's sometimes what we think when we read these place names, like... I don't even know if I pronounce that properly, Meribah and Massa in the desert. But what happened there in the desert? Why was it so bad that it prevented the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, from worship, from entering this eternal rest that we would now call heaven? This is pretty serious. 
that he's saying that the reason that God's chosen people weren't able to ever enter his rest is because they didn't know how he wanted them to live. They didn't know how to, to worship. So maybe we should take a look at what this psalm is talking about so that we don't make the same mistake. Exodus 17 says this, But the people were thirsty for water there. So they told Moses they weren't happy with him. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? Did you want us, our children and our livestock, to die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord. He said, What am I going to do with these people? They are almost ready to kill me by throwing stones at me. The Lord answered Moses, Go in front of the people. Take some of the elders of Israel along with you. Take in your hand the walking stick you used when you struck the Nile River. Go. I will stand there in front of you by the rock at Mount Horeb. Hit the rock. Then water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses hit the rock while the elders of Israel watched. Moses called that place Massa and Meribah. Okay. So they're in a desert. They ask for water. God miraculously gives them water. And this is one of the worst things to ever happen. Something's not adding up. This, this sequence of events stops their, their wow, stops their worship and closes the door to heaven. That story. And again, we can think, well, that was over 3,000 years ago to a bunch of people that we didn't know, nothing to do with us. We weren't there. We don't even know how to pronounce those weird place names. Let's just skip ahead and read the fun part again. But although we would like to distance that situation from us, I think all of us at times have been in a desert, haven't we? Maybe not a physical desert, but a spiritual desert. A time where things have just been dry, where things have been hard, where nothing seems to be growing, where that fruitfulness that was promised right back in the beginning, we're not seeing it, God. We're not hearing your voice, we're not seeing, like, haven't we all been there at, at least once? And so maybe we do have something to learn because if we react, if we respond that same way, this is the warning that Psalm 95 is bringing us, that there is a rest that God wants to lead us to that was always planned for us, but that we're going to miss out on if we don't understand this principle and what's going on here. So maybe, just like it says, maybe we don't know how to live, how God wants us to live. So maybe there's something that we're missing in this story. So we're, we're going to try to reenact this a little bit. So just bear with me. So Austin, can we have that picture up? Uh, can we have it in the middle screen? Fantastic. This is Meribah. This is uh, Mount Horeb. And this is potentially the rock that was struck. We don't know. There's a split in that rock. People think that it could be that. Okay. So this is kind of the setting. So we're, we're trying to recreate this picture of what's, of what's uh, going on. So, if I can grab, who am I going to grab? If I can grab Jacob Dawson. Can you come up here? And, uh, Jacob, you're 
just for this, you're going to be God. <laughs> All right. Not when you get back to the classroom. Okay. So now, uh, so you're standing. So it says that God came and stood. So if you can come and stand over here, because you're standing in front of the rock, uh, because that's where God said that he would come and stand before the people by the rock. So that's, that's you. Okay. So then uh, if I can get the rest of the worship team to come up because uh, we need some elders. There were some elders that were there. And uh, so we're going to get you guys to come up. And I'll just get you to stand over here. But uh, we might need a few extra people because how many tribes? So the setting of this, of course, was going through the, the Red Sea. They'd just come through the Exodus, escaped from Egypt. And so how many tribes uh, made it through the waters? Do you know how many tribes there were in Israel? Twelve. Okay. So if we have an elder, one representing each tribe. So how many? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So I need six more people. If we can just have one, two, three, four, five, six. If you can just come up and stand over there. Okay. Because all of this stuff is kind of happening. Okay. So we've got... We've got God standing before the rock. We've got the 12 elders that were there uh, watching, uh, looking on, and we've got the people. So for this analogy, if you can just, if you can be people, all right? Okay, so you're going to be people, and then I'm going to be Moses um, in this story. And it was an interesting part that said Moses needed to take the staff that struck the Nile. So it's interesting to me that, I mean, that, that staff did a lot of stuff. It was the staff that became a snake. It was the staff that, I mean, they just come through the Red Sea. You would think that, you know, if God's trying to get them to remember something, you would think that he would say, take the staff that you just parted the Red Sea with, the staff that brought deliverance. That's what we want to remember, isn't it? But it doesn't say that. It says, take the staff that struck the Nile. The Nile means judgment. So I don't have a staff, so I'm just going to... The, the sword is kind of judgment, okay? So we, we're sort of bringing judgment. So I'm, so I'm Moses. We've got the 12 people. We've got, got like... So this is kind of the picture. So I don't know... If anywhere else in life, if you've seen a scenario like this, there's someone up the front with an object of judgment in their hand. There's 12 people standing watching to assess what is being done. There's people that have brought an accusation against someone and... There's an accused. This is a court of law. We've got the, the jury. We've got the accusers. We've got the judge. Who's on trial? God. God is on trial. But, I mean, why, why is God on trial? He's... He's innocent. He, he's done nothing wrong. I mean, all he was trying to do was take the people from slavery in Egypt to Israel, the, the promised land. The desert was never their destination. The desert was never where they belonged. He's innocent, and yet he's the one calling for the trial. Why? Why? Why would he stand trial? Why would he stand accused when he's innocent? How did the psalm start? Can we have that next scripture up? Thanks, Austin. If we can just have it on the side screen, can we keep the, the rock in the middle? It says... Let's shout praises to the rock who saves us. That was verse 1. How can a rock save us? But it, it's rock with a capital R. This is, 
this is not just a rock. This is someone's name. This is a, this is a person that's somehow going to save us. What was, the, what was the verdict that was given? What was the decision? It says, strike the rock. But how, how can I strike the rock? If I strike the rock, God is in front. I can't strike the rock without striking God. I can't bring a complaint without that complaint affecting God. Anytime I come in complaint, anytime I come in judgment, I can't worship. We either wound or we worship. Those are the two choices. Every time we come to God, we either wound or we worship. And so we strike. And what happens? Water flows. This kind of looks familiar to another scene, doesn't it? Where there was a a trial, where there was an unjust man put on trial who was innocent, who was just, all he was trying to do was take his people from bondage, from, from slavery to this place of eternal rest, a place, a promised land where they always belong, where he always intended for them to be, that they could never get on their own. But we stop to complain in the desert. And yet, he said, strike. Strike the rock. When Jesus, on a different mountain, was struck, blood and water flowed from him to bring salvation to us that we could have never purchased for ourselves to bring us into that place of eternal rest. And yet every time we come, we strike. We come in judgment. We say, God, why this diagnosis? You're obviously not powerful. Judgment. God, why am I still single? You're obviously not loving. Judgment. God, why this corrupt government? You're obviously not all-powerful. Judgment. God, why all this hurt and pain? I thought this life was supposed to be about my comfort. So, not your will, but mine be done. Judgment. You guys can take your seats. Worship team, you can start to play. This is the picture that this psalm is trying to get us to avoid. It's trying to say to us we only have two choices we either ask God to come and stand before us in judgment or we come and we bow down before him in worship I said I only have one point today and that is to get you to wow in the desert not wow at me not wow at anything that I have said but wow in a God who would allow himself to be struck 
who would allow himself to be declared guilty although he was innocent. That in our desert times and in your desert times and in those times where you are crying out, where is this fruit that you promised? I don't want to hear your voice, God. That we would stop and that we would remember in our everyday, in our desert times, who He is and what He has done for us. That we need to worship Him as Creator, as King, as Shepherd, as the Rock of our redemption that allowed Himself to be struck for you and me and water and blood flowed to bring life and life eternal to us. So would you stand? We're going to worship. We're not going to sing a song. We're going to worship. We're not just going to raise our hands. We're going to surrender. We're not just going to open our mouth. We're going to shout to our God who finds us in those desert places, who comes to us in our guilt and shame and condemnation when we want to step back, that He is going to step in and He is going to bring that life-giving water to each and every one of us as we worship Him for who He is, the God that He is and what He has done for each one of us. Let's worship, church. I count on one thing, the same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails, will not fail me now, you won't fail me now, in the waiting, the same God who's never late, is working all things out, you're working all things out, yes I will. Lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. I choose.
just to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. I just to praise, to glorify, glorify. Nothing can stand against. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. thank you that you're here, that you teach us over and over of your goodness, of your faithfulness to us. And God, I just thank you, Father, that you love to hear our voice, that you love to hear our worship, that you love to hear our cries, our, our hearts' desires, our hearts' pleas. pleads. And God, I just pray, Father, that we will just really lean into your voice, Father God. And listen to you, Father God, all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Josh, for that beautiful message. That was amazing. Yes. And I just want to encourage you guys, all through life, there's a call and response. Call and response isn't there to, to what God is um, saying and speaking and speaking into our lives. And, you know, it's only one time that he was silent, and that was on the cross. That was only one time where he stood silent, he, he hung there silent. And when God was silent towards him, he didn't even hear his voice, but he loves to hear your voice. So if you have a cry on your heart, if you want prayer for anything, we would love to um, stand by you to listen, to um, pray with you because God is no longer silent, is he? It was only that once and that was it to bring us redemption. So if there's, um, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, there is a whole new life that is yet to be experienced through Him. So we would love to, to pray with you. We have a beautiful team at the back there. So please come. And otherwise, um, have a fantastic week. We have Rod Cornish's birthday today. So someone buy him lunch. And uh, please join us for Liberté afterwards. Thanks, team. Oh, all right, we're going to finish off with Echo. Love 
it's holding on and it won't let go, no. Feel it breaking out like an echo, echo in my soul. Decided I'm not giving up. So you won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. Hey, I feel it breaking out like an echo. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. No, I feel it breaking out, breaking out. Hey, your love is holding on and it won't let go. Feel it breaking out like an echo. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. No, feel it breaking out like an echo, echo in my soul. Oh, 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 o